Good morning. We have had absolutely wonderful weather all week. It's been in the 50s and 60s and all the snow has melted. However, tonight or tomorrow is supposed to start snowing again and we've got this big Albuquerque low that's supposed to come in and it's supposed to dump us with like a foot of snow. You can see on this screenshot from my iPad that Colorado Springs just really seems to lay right at the dead center of the vortex of this storm as it passes through Colorado. I don't know about you, but I personally find that weather forecasters are pathological liars and they just really like to wing things. So we shall see what happens here. You're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and graduate schools for the past 20 plus years and bring it to you on YouTube so that you can read your Bible in a more stimulating, engaged, and productive manner. Today, we're taking on the big one, the big kahuna itself, John 3.16. John 3.16 is perhaps one of the best known passages in the Bible. The problem is, is that John 3.16 is embedded right in the middle of a very dense passage of John's Gospel. So let's take a deep drink from this passage and look at these verses and the context in which it's located. John chapter 3 verses 14 through 21, which are the readings out of the lectionary this week. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version today. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Contextually, in the first half of this chapter in John 3, 1 through 11, Jesus has been meeting with Nicodemus. And this is where we get the famous line, you must be born again or you must be born from above. The passage opens with Nicodemus approaching Jesus and saying, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. And it ends with Jesus telling him, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't even understand these things? I'm not going to get into this much more than this in this video. You can check out my other video on dialogue where I go into the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. The only point I want to bring out here is that we're not sure where Jesus' words end and those of John begin or the narrator takes over. This is often pretty hard to determine in biblical texts because they didn't use quotation marks back then. This is often pretty hard to determine in John's Gospel because oftentimes he will go from Jesus' words into his theological narration or explanation of it. He weaves Jesus' words together with the theological implications behind those. Now, most commentators agree that up to verse 10 and 11, we have the voice of Jesus. The question is, where does John transition to his role as the narrator taking over giving a theological exposition of Jesus' teachings? And even if you look at red letter Bibles, some only have the red letters down to verse 11, some go down to verse 14, some go down to 18, some will take it all the way down to verse 21. But most of the commentaries agree that by verse 14 at the very latest, John is now giving his theological exposition. We have shifted from dialogue to monologue, from characters to narrator. Now, I'm not real firm on where I see this transition taking place in verses 11 through 14, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that by verse 14, John has taken over as a narrator. Our reading for the lectionary begins here with verse 14. 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now this links us back to the passage out of Numbers 21, and I'll include the reference here so you can go back and look at that. But in that story, the people of Israel have complained against God and against Moses, bringing them out into the wilderness to die. And so God then sends these fiery serpents to bite the people. The people then repent, call out to Moses for salvation. So God commands Moses to create this image in the likeness of these snakes to place it on a standard and then lift it up. Then when a person is bit by one of these serpents, all they have to do is look at that image and they will be healed from that snake bite. Now John's use of Numbers 21 is pretty straightforward and it's based around two points of analogy. The first is this verb being lifted up. In Numbers 21, Moses had an image of a serpent made and was placed on this standard and it was lifted up. And when someone was bitten by one of these serpents, if they looked at that image, they would be healed from their snake bite. John picks up on this verb, lifted up, and creates a play on words. Once again, see my video on dialogue. I'll put a link in the show more section under this video for you to go directly to it. But throughout Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus, Jesus employs a number of double entendres or split references. The same is being employed here. Lifting up can refer to Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. Just like Moses' serpent was placed on a pole, so Jesus will be lifted up on a cross. However, in John, the idea of being lifted up refers not just to Jesus' crucifixion, but also to his glorification. John links the two together throughout his gospel, the cross and the exaltation of Jesus. And these two events are viewed as one continuous process. And you can take a look at John chapter 8, verse 28, and then chapter 12, I think it's verse 32. The second analogy he makes is the link between the Israelites looking at this serpent of bronze and then living or being healed. Whenever someone believes or looks at Jesus, they will live also. But only instead of being healed from a snake bite and living a little bit longer, now a person is healed in the sense that they will receive eternal life. This brings us to John 3.16. Now don't tune out on me at this point, but in order to understand John 3.16, we need to discuss its grammatical structure. This verse is rather complex, and it's made up of three clauses. It's the little connecting words that link this sentence together that help us to see the logic and the thought, or what this verse means. So John 3.16 in the NRSV reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Now the first clause is, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world, this is the main clause and the main idea of the verse. God's immeasurable love for the world. The little word for at the beginning there connects us back to the previous verses. John uses this word gar or for in English to continue discourse, to keep the reader moving along. It's indicating that we shouldn't see this as a big break in thought, but to continue going along. You can see the same thing at the beginning of 317. He uses the same word there again, only the NRSV translates it as indeed at that point. The second word we need to consider is so or hotos. This can be interpreted to convey the high degree of God's love or to express how this love is performed. Since it falls at the very start of this verse and not close to the second clause, I think it's really bringing across this idea of the high degree of God's love, the great immeasurable love that God has for us. The next word that I really want to consider is the word cosmos here, or world. This word has a wide range of meanings in ancient Greek, it can refer from everything that is created, the totality of everything that there is that's created, to mankind or down to jewelry or adornment. This is where we get the English word cosmetics from, from this Greek word cosmos. 
In this particular context, in John 3.16, it's referring to everyone who's alive on the face of the earth. We can contextually see this because he's going to go on and qualify it with the word everyone who believes. Now, the love that God has is not just for the people who live north of a border or a particular skin color or believe a certain doctrine or are part of a certain faith. It is for everyone in the entire world. And if you're a person who believes in the Son of God, then you need to see the world from God's perspective. That God has a sacrificial and unqualified love that extends to each and every person on the face of the earth. You're not special. Everyone is loved by God. We now come to the second clause here. That he gave his only son. And let me move this down here so we can kind of see the relationship here. This clause begins with the word that in English or hosta in Greek. And this little conjunction is used to express results. God's love for the world resulted in his giving his only son. The gift of God's only Son speaks about the Incarnation and the Crucifixion. In John's Gospel, Jesus is going to be crucified not because of conflict that he enters into with the Jewish or the Roman leaders, but because God loves us. The third clause is, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Once again, this has a little connecting word at the very beginning here that's translated as so that in English, henna in Greek. And this conjunction is used to communicate the purpose behind why God gave his only son. The big idea of this verse as we look at how these clauses link together is that God loved the world. This is the main idea. The result of this love is that he gave his only begotten son. The purpose or the reason why he gave his son is so that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Lest we miss the point here at the very end of it, John communicates this idea in both a positive and negative manner. On the negative side, he says, may not perish. On the positive side, he says, but may have eternal life. This is the goal here. Because of God's immeasurable love for us, he gave his son. The purpose of giving the son is so that we might have eternal life. Now, just to go off on a little point here, an interesting feature in John's gospel is the use of this verb to believe. Now, if I do a quick search for this Greek verb, and I really need to do a video to show you how you can do these types of searches off the English text, but just for the sake of time for this video, I'm going to cheat and use the Greek. So if I do a search for the Greek word pistio, and I open up a search results window here, we can see that John uses this verb 98 times. Now that's not significant in itself, but if we compare it to Matthew, Matthew only uses it 11 times. Luke 14, Mark 9. The closest parallel that we have is the book of Acts, which uses this verb 37 times. Now, by contrast, if we search for the noun faith, pistis, what you notice here is that we've got this big open area on the chart where John should have some mention of the word pistis for faith, but he doesn't use it, not even once. For John, believing is an active process. It's something that we do not something that we have. And he pictures the Christian faith in a very dynamic manner throughout his gospel. Okay, I need to take a breather because we've been going through a lot of material in a very rapid succession. So let's take a breather here and pick up again with verse 17. Now, lest someone misunderstand John 3:16. In the next verse, he clarifies the idea. Jesus did not come to judge the world, but to save it. And the Greek word that's used for judgment here is krino. This is the verb. The noun based on this verb is used in verse 19, krisis. And this is where we get the English word crisis. Now, as a small side note, mainly because it's Lent, 
This crisis that Jesus precipitates forces us to consider whether we are moving into the light or seeking shelter from it. A great meditation to contemplate during Lent is what direction is your life headed in? Are you moving into the life so that your life can be exposed and brought into the light? Or are you seeking concealment, trying to keep the deepest parts of your life hidden from others? The crisis of the incarnation, crucifixion, and exaltation of Christ is that Jesus as the light has come into the world and everyone who practices truth comes into the light so that their lives might be exposed. In verses 18 through 21, John now explains verses 16 and 17. He shows how the shoe leather hits the road. But he also expands upon ideas in the prologue in John chapter 1 about the light coming into the world. In John chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, he writes, In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now in this passage, he picks up on what he introduces there and begins to explicate it or explain it a little bit more. So returning to chapter 3, judgment in that passage is based upon how a person responds or decides or views Jesus, the light of the world. Eternal life is knowing Christ, the light that has come into the world. Judgment is a reaction against the light. In this passage, he focuses on the extreme love that God has for the world, his sacrificial giving to save the world, and balances that with the human responsibility of how we respond to that light. A person's acceptance or rejection of the truth doesn't say anything about the truth from John's perspective, but it tells you a lot about that person. Now you can see how John develops these themes in this passage here. God has given his son to save the world so that we might have eternal life. This life is related to the metaphor of light. Jesus is the light that shines into the world and he brings the light of salvation. The judgment that John talks about here is how we respond to that light. Do we approach it or do we move away from it? into the light of salvation or deeper into darkness. Judgment in this passage is about us, not God's judgment of us. Rudolf Boltman has a great quote in regard to this passage here. He says, in the decision of faith or unbelief, it becomes apparent what a man really is and what he always was. So let's summarize what we have in this passage and this chapter as a whole. If we back up to Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, we can see a rather interesting theological progression being made. This chapter opens with Jesus dialoguing with Nicodemus about the Spirit of God in verses 1 through 11. This then moves in verses 12 through 15 about a discussion of the Son of Man ascending and descending or being lifted up. Then in verses 16 and 17, John gives us this amazing statement about God's immeasurable love for the world. And then finally, he uses the metaphors of life and light to explain our reaction to this crisis or this judgment of love, revelation, and salvation. Okay, that was a mouthful. I hope you found this very quick tour through the second half of John's Gospel thought and faith provoking. If you find these videos beneficial for your life and faith, please subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up, whereas a student of mine said a while ago they coined a new verb, thumb up it. You can also leave questions and comments underneath this video. I try and answer them whenever it's possible. Until next week and we continue our journey through Lent, peace.